Hello, everybody. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Welcome to When Harry Met Board Games. I am Harry, and today I am presenting my top 50 games of all time. Um, and I just want to explain a little bit about myself and give a little context as to why this is a top 50 games list as opposed to the typical top 100 list that many other YouTube personalities are making. Um, I consider myself to be a relatively new gamer. I consider myself to be a noob. I've been in this hobby for about three years now and I learned lots of games and played lots of games but at the same time as I worked on my rankings I really came to the realization that you know once I get to a certain part of my list, I'm no longer really excited or loving these games. So I feel that number 50, the top 50 games, is a safe number. It's something that I feel very satisfied with sharing with other people. It's uh, games that I enjoy a lot, that I want to play more and more. Games that bring me excitement, that bring me great joy games that are well received by the people that I play with. Uh, another important thing to know about me is that most of the people I game with are close friends and family, my wife, people who, while they enjoy gaming with me and uh, have a lot of fun doing it, they're not necessarily gamers per se, and that's not something that they've adopted as a hobby for themselves. But they indulge me and um, and they love to play with me and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. So these are my top 50 games. Today I'll be presenting numbers 50 through 41. And I'm going to try to upload one or two of these a week as we go all the way down to my top 10 of all time. So I'll go through all these games and I'll share a few comments, a, few, um, a little bit of information for those who might be interested in pursuing these games or purchasing these games i'd like to share that as well so let's uh begin with my number 50 game of all time my number 50 game of all time is deception murder in hong kong and this is designed by toby ho and published by gray fox games um this game is a few years old it's a social deduction who done it type of game the more the merrier the more people play the funner the game is or the more fun the game is i should say um it's a good game for a party setting it's a good game for when you have a a sizable group who wants to play a light kind of kind of like in the spirit of clue but for gamers um i've had a lot of fun playing this with friends with my nephews in particular and it's a game that I don't see trending upwards on my list per se because these kind of games don't tend to trend upwards for me. These more like party environment, bigger groups type type of games. But um, but it's a game that it's, that I like a lot. I'm I'm very excited about it right now, and I think it should hold strong for a few years to come at least. Uh, that's my number 50 game of all time, Deception Murder in Hong Kong. Now let's move on to my number 49. My number 49 game of all time is Raw, published by Windrider Games, their Euro Classics branch, and designed by prolific game designer Dr. Reiner Knizia. This game is an auction bidding game, which Reiner Knizia tends to do a lot of these games. But it's a unique uh, auction bidding game because instead of bidding with money or cash or some type of um, literal currency, you are bidding with these numbered tokens. And they're, they're ranged from 1 through 16, depending on how many people are playing in the game. And you are bidding these to earn these different tiles. It's a set collection game. You, you score based on acquiring different sets of tiles, and some tiles are more valuable than others. But when you bid... The person who bids the higher number tile wins all the other tiles that are on the board at the moment and adds it to their tableau. And then when they win, they take a numbered tile that was on the board along with these other sets of tiles 
and replaces it with the number tile that they just finished bidding with. And these number tiles are also part of the scoring at the end of the game. So it's a tightrope that you're trying to, to walk because you want to win these sets, but at the same time, you don't want to overpay for them because, again, these number tiles are very valuable at the end of the game. It's very, very unique. Uh, game. I like the Egyptian theme. Um, I find it to be simple to teach, simple to learn, but a fun game to play. And that's my number 49 game, Ra. Now we move on to my number 48 game of all time, which is Merchants of Amsterdam. Again, designed by Dr. Reiner Knizia and published by Rio Grand Games. This game is a game that nobody talks about. It is out of print. Um, it's not a game that is um, hyped up by many people, and I imagine most people in the gaming hobby might have not even heard of this game. But I think this is a really good game. Again, this is a uh, an auction bidding game with an element of area control slash area majority, because there are three realms, so to speak, that you are trying to have majority in. You have the warehouses in Amsterdam you have the um, offices throughout the wor world in particular the four sectors of the world and then you have your ships that are bringing in the goods and as the game goes along you have a track that kind of um, simulates different events or um, catastrophes sometimes even that happen throughout the game that affect the players positively and negatively depending on their circumstances. Also, every so often, you score in one of the three different areas, the warehouses, the offices, or the ships. And you're trying to have majority or maybe be the secondary player in all of these areas to score accordingly. Now, what's interesting about this game is the way that the auction and bidding works. Instead of having just a simple shout out loud and state what your bid is, you have this little clock-like device, a little clock-like gadget. I might even have to show it so people could understand what I'm talking about. All right, let us see right here. You do have paper money here. If you're not a big fan of paper money, you might not like that. But you have this little gadget over here. And the way it works is you have it, you wind it up to the start. And the first number you'll see here is 200, and it goes all the way down to the number 50. And you start it. And basically, players are kind of, you know, edging and, and, and trying to, you know, see when they could press the, the, the buzzer here and stop it because where it stops, the number it stops on, is how much money you're going to pay for what you are bidding for. And, you know, there's the tension of, I don't want to bid too much for it, but if I wait too long, the other person might stop the buzzer before me. So it's a very, very uh, clever and exciting way of doing bidding. Now, the other interesting thing about this game, and I forgot to mention, and I probably should have mentioned before, it, before, is what you are bidding for. So at the start of each player's turn, they actually draw three cards, one at a time, and they must make the decision of what they're gonna do with these three cards individually before they draw the next card. So the three options they have is they could either discard that card if they're not interested in it, or they could put it up for auction if they are mildly interested in it, or if they are very excited about what that card is and where it will let them uh, wield influence on the board, then they can just take it straight up for free. The, the tension in this game is, when you draw your first card, what do you do? You might feel so-so about this card, and you might decide to discard it, or you just place it for auction, hoping that one of the next two cards you draw is better or more productive for your current game situation. However, you have to take the risk because you don't know what's next, and you might be very upset when you passed up this mediocre, not-too-great card, and end up being stuck with a card that doesn't really do anything for you. So again, I find that to create for some very tense, interesting decisions in the game. And I feel like 
I, I might be hyping this game up too much. I will be honest, component-wise, you could tell that it's an old game. This was published in the year 2000. It looks old. It looks, component-wise, it looks bad even for its time. But if you don't mind maybe tricking the games up a little bit, or maybe you don't even care too much about the way a game looks and how it plays, I think this is a game that can be fun. And up to now, I've had fun playing it. And that's my number 48 Merchants of Amsterdam. Now we move on to my number 47. My number 47 is Small World. It's published by Days of Wonder and the designer is Philippe K. Arts. I think and hope I'm saying that name right. Philippe K. Arts. Small World is a area control game where you are controlling different races and you are invading surrounding territories. It's a it's called Small World because the map is very tight. It is a small map and it it's modified and it's a, 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 it adapts to the amount of players. For example, the base game comes with boards for two, three, four, and five player games, and each um, map barely accommodates that player count, which forces uh, conflict and it forces battle. Um, the way this game works is you have deterministic combat instead of just rolling a die. There is a die in this game, but it's it's not used quite as often as in most of these type of games. Instead, you have the tiles that represent your units, your force, uh, your forces. And when you are going to conquer an area, you just need to make sure that you have as more tiles than what are more tokens. These are tokens. More tokens that are than what are in that area you're trying to invade plus two and basically as long as you have enough tokens you can keep on invading new territories and then at the end of the turn you can reinforce accordingly to protect your borders and make yourself strong the interesting part about this game is that you cannot go the whole game with your starting a um, fantasy race because eventually you thin out and you become weak and vulnerable and you won't be able to score the, the necessary points to win the game. And your opponents will just run over you and take advantage of you. So at some point in the game, if not maybe even two or three times in the game, you have to make the very difficult decision of putting your race into decline. And basically what you're saying is, I am no longer going to operate with this race. Um, I've moved on. This race will pick up a few points for you uh, over the next couple rounds probably perhaps until they eventually get totally wiped off the face of the board but now you're going to move on to a new race and this is the race that's going to conquer new lands for you and score you new points it's a really cool game it has a very interesting um mechanism for drafting the different races and each of the races is combined with a different power so the race in itself gives you a power and then there's an additional special power that's combined with that race it gives so much um possibility for for different combinations the replayability of this game is incredible um so if you like that type of game that risk type of feel but are not a big fan of how long risk lasts for example and you're not a big fan of how lucky risk feels and also just how how prone to turtling and avoiding conflict risk can be, especially if you start out in Australia, right? So I find that this game eliminates all those problems, plus adds some clever mechanisms for drafting and some uniqueness and asymmetry as far as players feeling different because they control different races and different powers. So that is my number 47 game of all time. And it is Small World. Now let's move on to my number 46 game of all time, which is In the Year of the Dragon. Designed by Stefan Feld, published by Ravensburger Games. This game, <clears throat> it is very famous and notorious, I should say, for being a punishing game, for being a mean game. Um, it's not a cooperative game. It's a competitive game. Player versus player or player versus players versus players. And it's the game itself that beats you up because basically the game consists of 12 rounds representing the 12 months of the Year of the Dragon. And in each of those months, except for the first two, which are months of peace, in each of those last 10 months, 
some disastrous calamity is taking place. It might be famine. It might be warfare. It might be the increase of taxes by the king. It might be disease. And you've got to prepare for each of these calamities by drafting and recruiting different um, workers that will protect you and ease the consequences of some of these calamities for you. However, it is impossible to do enough in this game. It is impossible to be prepared enough. It is impossible to avoid all of the casualties that these disasters are going to bring upon you. So you've kind of got to pick and choose what you're going to avoid and what is realistic to accomplish. It is fun game. It is it is tight. It is it is mean, but at the same time, you feel vindicated and, and accomplished when at the end of the game, you've been resourceful enough to outlast or outsurvive your opponents. You could say, you know what? The Year of the Dragon, it really beat me up, but it beat you up worse than it beat me up. And it does feel fulfilling to have that. Besides, I do like the game within the game that this provides where you are playing certain characters and recruiting certain characters and some of them give you more um, abilities to, to deflect some of these disasters, while others give you the ability to go up on the player order track further and further. So sometimes you might take an inferior work or inferior uh, tile that's not going to help you that much currently in the, in the game and the disaster that's coming, coming uh, soon, but at the same time it prepares you to um, have a better advantage in future turns because you will advance further on the player order track and it will be harder for some of the players that are behind you to catch up. So it gives you that opportunity to sometimes make a decision planning forward and not necessarily for the immediate present, right? This game is a, is a good game again. It's a, a little bit old. I do have the 10-year anniversary uh, edition right here, but it is a classic, and if you can appreciate a game being tight, a game being a little mean, a little brutal. If you can appreciate a game where you're not necessarily going to feel like the richest person alive at the end of the game, but you can feel accomplished and resourceful and resilient, then this can be a game for you. My number 46 game of all time in the year of the dragon. Now we move on to my number 45 game of all time in the same vein, Notre Dame. Designed again by Stefan Fell and published again by Ravensburgers Games. And again, this is the 10-year uh, anniversary edition. Notre Dame, very similar to In the Year of the Dragon. They were both published in the same year. And I think, philosophically speaking, Stefan Fell was in the same place with these games. Because this game can also be pretty um, brutal. You just have one disaster to worry about, which is the Black Plague, I guess, or some kind of plague involving rats that you're trying to hold at bay. You can never completely stop this infestation. But if you prepare accordingly, you can you can hold it at bay and not be so affected by it. Because again, what this plague does is it hurts your game situation. It takes points away from you. But in this game, you are trying to um, advance in your own part of the city. Uh, around the Cathedral of Notre Dame and you have all these different sectors that benefit you in different ways and basically help you uh, score points in different ways. What's interesting in here is you are uh, drafting cards at first. There's a draft right before right before each round and um, you have some of your cards and then you could get some of your opponent's cards depending on which ones you think are more beneficial to you. And you'll basically draft three cards but you only get to use two for each round. And maybe whatever your opponents choose might change your mind as to what was your second card going to be. And what's interesting about this game is for each card you play, you place a cube on a specific sector in your board and you collect its benefit. However, as the game progresses, with each subsequent cube that you place on that sector of the board, you will benefit more. So if placing one cube on this part of the city helps you collect one, one coin, when you place a second cube later on in the game, it's going to help you collect two points. 
if placing a cube on this sector in the city helps you score one prestige or one victory point, then later on in the game, when you place down a second cube on that sector, it's going to help you collect two prestige points. I find that to be a very cool mechanism. It gives the feel of a slow build, but again, not the feel of you know the rich get richer because you you'll be limited to as to how many cubes you can put in your board because first of all you have a limited supply to start with and you have to work towards even recruiting more of those cubes furthermore you've got the play track to to keep back and that's going to take some actions away from what you would want to have wanted to have done otherwise in the board to prosper so again that's kind of holds you back, it creates that tense, tight feel, very similar to In the Year of the Dragon. It's a little bit less brutal, um, and I find the drafting mechanism, is, which is one of my favorite mechanisms, to be, to be fun. I like the cube, cube placement on the board, so all these things help it to edge out In the Year of the Dragon as far as I am concerned, but I could totally see how other people, my wife in particular, likes in the year of the dragon a lot more than she likes Notre Dame but I could see how some people would would arrive to that conclusion but Notre Dame it's a it's a fun game it's a it, it's it's a, again a classic it's not too long it, it has a pretty good time length and it just it just creates that tight experience again of trying to be more resilient or more resourceful than your opponents and it accomplishes that that's my number 45 game of all time Notre Dame. Now we move on to my number 44 game of all time, and it is Airlines Europe, designed by Alan Moon and published by Rio Grande Games. Airlines Europe is, it's kind of like a spiritual successor to Ticket to Ride, even though I do know that its parent game, Union Pacific, um, and Airlines, which I think is even older, they they kind of precede Ticket to Ride. So you could say Ticket to Ride is really an evolution from that idea. Um, it has that route network connection building that you're doing through a map. It's particularly a map of Europe. But the routes don't belong to you. The routes just represent independent airline companies that you can acquire stocks or shares of stocks in. It has a nice, simple... Um, mechanism for drafting the stocks and um and it just gives this nice feel of wealth and prosperity for those who play this game even if you lose you still feel wealthy you still feel feel rich you kind of have a little bit of that monopoly feel without having to monopolize and run over your competition um it has that spatial orientation feel how do i connect this city to that city because if i do then that airline will get an eight point bonus and that will help it be more valuable to me because i happen to have the most shares in that company it creates for lots of um tight decisions um fun decisions i think this game i, I don't know I, the replayability or lack thereof because there's no expansions because there's no other maps because there's no other airline companies i don't know it keeps it from being ranked higher than some other route network connection games that I might have in my list. But I do enjoy this game. It is a solid game. I don't see it trending upwards. Uh, most of the people that I've played this game with have been very so-so about it. They haven't they haven't really been excited or thrilled to play it. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, this is a good game. I could play this. This is fun. But they're not, you know, raving about it as they might be about some of the other games on my list. So that also might um, hurt its chances of trending upwards in my list. But for now, it is ranked number 44, which is a really high number. And that's Airlines Europe. Now we move on to my number 43 game of all time. And that is... Kingdom Builder, designed by Donald X. Vaccarino and published by Queen Games. Kingdom Builder. This game is... One of the things I like about this game is the variability, right? This game has so many combinations of, of setups 
you know, just to start the game. Just in its base game, you the, the game comes with eight different boards that you use each for each game. You use four of them to randomly create the game board for that game. And it provides the, the terrain setup. Ooh, this is a game that has different terrains uh, represented on the board, on the game map. It has, uh, you know, forests and it has... Uh, uh, flower fields and grass fields and it has deserts and it has mountains and it has rivers it has uh, canyons so they are representing the board and the configuration is always going to change depending on how these four boards combine and you have eight to pick from just from the base game also you have different special locations like castles and farms and you know different different things water towers or watchtowers i should say that you know, are represented on the board by special tokens that when you connect your settlements, you're trying to put settlements down on the board. When you connect your settlements to these locations, you draw their tile and that gives you a special power that differentiates you from other players in future turns. Also, this game has a different scoring um, condition for each game. So basically, you have these kingdom cards and I believe the game comes with about eight of them. And for each game, you're going to pick three of those eight cards and those three cards are going to tell you how you score in this game so the scoring conditions are not always going to be the same so it's something that i appreciate not only because it's going to feel different i also appreciate it because it makes you it challenges you to not be complacent in your strategy or in your tactics because you're realizing that what worked for you in a previous game isn't necessarily going to work for you in this game because the scoring conditions are totally different. So that's something that I, I really much appreciate. Variability, replayability, these are two very, very important factors in particular to me uh, as a gamer. Um, I know some other people um, might value it a little bit less. I think everybody values replayability, but I guess we might interpret it differently. For some people, uh, variable startup scenarios don't necessarily, um, you know, mean that the game is going to be more replayable than a game that always starts up the same. For me, I like that. I like that concept of, hey, I'm starting the game, and even from the even from the get go, it looks and feels different. That is something that I could get behind, and I really appreciate the way that uh, Donald X, X Factor Hero accomplishes this in Kingdom Builder. Now, one critique that lots of people have about this game is the limit of choices because you really only have a hand of one card and you play that card and that is where you must build your settlements. However, there are lots of decisions because depending on where you put your settlements, you're always putting three down on each turn and you're always obligated to put them adjacent to settlements that you already have on the board if it's at all possible. The decisions of as to where you put these definitely affect future decisions and can open up possibilities for you Go down the line if you choose wisely you put yourself in a better position to manipulate the board and spread yourself as much as you would like to so although although you could say that there might not be too many decisions in this game at the same time the few decisions that are there are very crucial they're very very important and very very tight and tense and and make for a very a tactical game where you need to kind of adapt to what other players are doing on the board and the card the one card that you are drawing at the end of each of your turns it's a good game um i i see it trending upwards in my list just because of how simple it is to play and how well it's been received by people that i've played it with so far that's my number 43 game of all time kingdom builder now let's move on to my number 42 game of all time, which is Santiago de Cuba. This is a game designed by Michael Rinek and published by Ludanova Games, a Spanish board game company. Uh, this game is, well, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about why I purchased this game. I purchased this game because my wife, Lily, is from Cuba. She was born in Cuba. She left Cuba at the age of eight years old. So the cultural 
value of this game is very high. I bought this as a gift to her a few years ago for her birthday. But as I've played the game, I have enjoyed it. It is in my top 50 games. I like it. It has a rondel mechanism where you're going around Santiago de Cuba spot by spot, traveling to different merchants or or, or people in the community uh, and, and in, in a car, in, a, in one little car, everybody gets a turn moving that car and you, you can manipulate how far you go on that rondel by paying more coins. You know, there's a certain amount of spots that you can move for free and by paying a little bit more, you get to move a little further. And then after you're done moving on that rondel and interacting with whatever merchant or worker was there, then you you go to one of the four sectors of the board and you have a worker placement phase where depending on the color of the player you, you chose on the rondel, that determines what section on the worker placement part of the board you get to go to. And you get to place your worker on a building and based on what building you place that worker on, you get to benefit off a certain uh, you know, thing that that, that, that that spot particularly gives you. Um, so it combines some very interesting mechanisms, the rondel, the worker placement. I really enjoy worker placement. I know my wife really enjoys worker placement. Um, also, you're trying to ship certain goods at the end of each round, and there is a supply and demand. So certain goods are more in demand and others are less so. So you're trying to work your way around the board and make your decisions so that you're in the position to fulfill those demands better than your opponents can. It's a it's it's an interesting game. Again, I think the Cuban theme really helps it a lot. I think the fact that it is a Spanish edition of the game, the rules are in Spanish and the 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 player characters are in Spanish. I think that's also uh, made it very fun for my wife, who is again a native Cuban, where Spanish is still the language of her heart. I think she's had lots of fun uh, playing this game, and I've had lots of fun playing with her too. So that's a game to consider for people who might want to uh, learn a little bit more about Cuban uh, culture. I'm lying, this game has nothing to do really with Cuban culture. I mean, I guess some, some of the words and some of the concepts might be a little bit cultural, but more than anything, it's just, it just, this just creates the ambiance for a person to, to put themselves in that setting. It's a good game. Maybe you should try it out. That's Santiago de Cuba, my number 42 game of all time. Now we move on to my number 41 game of all time. And that is King of Tokyo, designed by legendary designer Richard Garfield and published by Yellow Games. This game is probably the lightest game in my top 50 probably the shortest game in my top 50 this game this game could be done in 15 minutes you know maybe 20 it's a quick game it's a cutthroat game i the, the, what i enjoy about this game is so in this game everybody's controlling different monsters trying to take over tokyo and try to des destroy all the other monsters that are daring to threaten its rule in tokyo and you're rolling these dice yahtzee style you get up to three re-rolls and basically you're trying to either a score points or B, attack your opponents and eventually eliminate them. And what I enjoy about this player elimination game is that player elimination is not the only viable route. You can try to win this game by scoring victory points. And I have only won this game by scoring victory points. Very rarely have I even tried the other approach. And usually for me, it has not worked. Although I have been the victim of people who have won by elimination. But I myself have not uh, had the opportunity to lord that, uh, that humiliation over other players. It's a good game. It's a fun game. Even just trying to manipulate the situation of avoiding elimination. Because you can try to avoid elimination by rolling a certain combination of dice buying certain cards that help you heal and give you enough uh, health so that you can endure the attacks of your vicious opponents. And also, if you could be clever enough to score points in the meantime and race your opponents to 20 points and be the first person to, to cross that threshold, 
then you win the game. It's fun, it's silly, with the power-up expansion, each monster feels different, each player is going to feel different, they're going to have a few uh, set of abilities that nobody else is going to have. It creates different options for what you want to do with your dice. It's a, it's a good game. If any game on my list deserves the, the adjective, the description of being fun, it's this one. It is fun. Everybody I've played this game with has had fun. And it's hard to ignore that. For as light as it is, for as cutthroat as it is, for as short as it, as it is, it's hard to ignore that. This game is a filler game that I see myself never getting rid of. It's a game that you can always use to break the ice at a game night or to close things off at the end or to just kill some time in between games um, where you don't have the time to play a long game. This game, it just gives you a good feel of, of, a, after, after the game. You feel like you've played a very long and fulfilling game and and it's just excite, exciting. It creates lots of shouting type of moments. Sometimes you're shouting out of anger. Sometimes you're you're just cracking up in laughter. You know, other times you're just almost crying because you know you're about to be eliminated. It creates for memorable situations where you will constantly tell the story of this epic role that someone had where they needed to roll the right thing and they did or they didn't. It is definitely the kind of game that you will talk about after you've played. And again, it's the kind of game that will cement memories in your mind for years to come. And that's my number 41 game of all time, King of Tokyo. So that is my numbers 50 through 41, my first video out of my top 50 that I will be continue, continuing to record over the weeks. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this list. I hope you enjoyed the making of this video. Uh, feel free to comment down below, share some of your top 50 games of all time, maybe in particular your 50 to 41. Comment on how you feel about my 50 through 41, where you agree, where you disagree, anything that I might have missed in saying as far as my description of the games. Um, feel free to subscribe to our channel as well, When Harry Met Board Games, that way you can get updates and follow us as we continue to upload new content on this channel. Thank you so much for giving me your time and I will see you next time. I'm Harry from When Harry Met Board Games. Take care. Bye-bye.